Well, if you're visiting with us, we're in the middle of a series called Live No Lies. We were exploring um, this idea that we're all kind of living in this kind of space of warfare um, with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we've been working our way backwards. We've looked at the devil and uh, for a couple of weeks there. And uh, this is our second week looking at the flesh. Uh, and then the next two weeks, we're going to look at the world, the culture in which we're in. Um, and uh, this, this is very easy to preach from with integrity in terms of like the battle that goes on in all of us in terms of like this, there's this part of us that just wants to satisfy and, and seek pleasure in the short term. Uh, and there's this part of us that wants to live lives of integrity and to live good lives and beautiful lives. And those, like, there's this war that goes on. And, uh, and it's super encouraging to know that you're not the only one, right? I mean, I just feel a sense of relief in the room over the last couple of weeks. Like, ah, cool. Like, there's no exceptions. Now, there's some people that are better at hiding it than others. And Jesus called them Pharisees. So good on you if that's you. Uh, but, you know, for those of you that are, you know, used to feeling the vulnerability hangover of disclosing that broken part of yourself, then that's awesome. Uh, because it, on one level, it's like we've got to normalize that conversation of like there's this battle that's going on. Um, and whether you follow Jesus or not, there's this tug of war going on between our desires, some of them really helpful and healthy, some of them really destructive. But the way of Jesus has this unique contribution to make because the solution to the problem we call the flesh or the Bible calls the flesh is not willpower, um, but it's the Spirit's power. The Bible defines kind of the flesh as this kind of base animalistic primal drive in all of us for self-gratification. The part of our heart that is bent away from God and His definition of what is good and beautiful and true. Uh, so we looked at Galatians 5 last week at about the, like Paul's invitation to us. So like, how, do we like, how do we crucify the flesh? It's not just through willpower, gritting your teeth, white knuckling it. Um, because willpower is helpful, it's just really unreliable. Like if you got it, great. But most of the time my willpower is in Bali when I need it. Uh, and so I've got to work out another way. And so um, last week we're looking at Galatians 5. We're going to unpack a little bit more about what this looks like quite pragmatically. Uh, but actually we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and learn to walk with the Spirit and be in step with the Spirit. And Paul goes through this in Galatians 5. And what we looked at last week, and again, I'm not going to recap the whole thing. Everyone's like, why the heck did I turn up last week? We're going to, we're going to quickly just a little recap, and we can't go into depth. You jump into the podcast, hopefully, if you, if you haven't heard it. Um, but basically, this idea last week was like, basically, we looked at this idea that the West has redefined what freedom is. And, uh, and to the West and to our culture around us, it basically means I can do whatever I want to do. But, but Jesus and Paul and the writers of the New Testament actually define that as slavery. When we give into our flesh this part of our heart that is bent away, we become enslaved by our own desires, in particular our desires to sin. So we're going to continue to work our way through Galatians uh, into Galatians chapter 6. So let's, if you've got your Bibles or your Androids or tablets or whatever, or your scrolls, let's open there to Galatians chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, verse 1. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. God's heart is that this would be a community where, and this is his heart, that he's gentle in his restoration. But watch yourselves, or you may, selves be, you may also be tempted. Now, I've read that a whole lot of the time, and it's been like, you know, if I'm hanging out with a guy struggling with drinking, be careful as we kind of help this guy navigate that, that I don't feel tempted to also hit the raz. Because I, you know, and it's that's not actually what's going on here, uh, because that's really unlikely. Like I don't know if about you, but I just I haven't had that struggle. Uh, there's certain areas of my life that are vulnerabilities, but as we try and help restore people, uh, so now in the Bible we've got all these kind of chapter separations and stuff. That wasn't the the deal back in the day. So this flows on from what is our chapter five, and chapter five finishes with this verse: "Let us not become conceited or proud." provoking and envying each other. So the context here, and we'll see this actually outwork itself a little bit later on, is don't fall into the temptation, not of the sin that the person's struggling with, but the sin of being proud that you don't struggle with that sin. That makes way more sense, right? Where you feel superior to the other person. We're all sinners in need of God's grace and mercy. We all just have our different vulnerabilities. Uh, and so if someone's caught in sin, uh, in love, gently restore them. Verse 2, carry each other's burdens. I've mentioned this a whole lot of times. Um, 
it's very hard to carry a burden if you haven't shared the burden. Now, it can be a bit of a struggle, again, because it requires some vulnerability. But sometimes I've heard through the grapevine, even in, in church, I've been in ministry nearly 20 years, people have been frustrated because I'm, the church hasn't been supporting them carrying a burden that we weren't aware of. And I'm like, and somehow we're meant to intuitively have worked it out. I'm just, I'm sorry, like I'm not Jesus. I just cannot know a couple of hundred people's issues. It's impossible for me to intuitively pick all that stuff up. So the biblical thing is share it, and then we get to have the privilege of carrying that. And that's, again, normal in this environment where we're carrying each other's uh, burdens. And this way you fulfill the law of, of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something they are not, they deceive themselves. So again, it's uh, um, that thing of pride. Oh, I don't, I don't struggle anymore. Um, I've nailed this or whatever. Everyone should take a step back and test their own actions. So you should have this whole thing of like it's really healthy and important to self-examine, to reflect, to take a step back. And, and certainly to consider if you're happy with the trajectory of your soul. If you tease out like how much you're being transformed into Jesus' image, if, you're, if you've teased that out over the next couple of decades, are you happy with how it's tracking? Or is it like pretty flat in terms of change? You know, again, we should be just getting transformed into his image more and more. Uh, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Again, this is the comparison thing, the pride thing. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Uh, that's a good verse, just by the way, for a preacher. Like, I, I get so encouraged all the time. Like, my, so many of my pastor friends are discouraged, and I'm not, and I feel bad about it. I really do sometimes. I went to a retreat a couple of weeks ago with a whole bunch of pastors in our movement, and we had to go around the circle and check in with how you're doing. And, like, unfortunately, I had to go first, and I was like, I feel amazing. I feel so filled with joy, and I'm encouraged with what God's doing in our church, and I'm meeting him in my private world with Jesus, and I feel amazing. And then we went around the rest of the circle, and everyone's discouraged and struggling, and I was like, I'm through it. And literally that whole retreat, I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I'm doing well. I feel terrible. Terrible, I'm doing well. Oh, but you know why? It's because uh, if you receive instructions in the Word. They should share the good things with their instructor. I'm getting feedback all the time of God, the stuff that God's doing in people's lives that's just making me a very happy pastor. I love what God's doing. And like, I've got a list of people I, I'm like, I want them to share their testimony of what God's doing and their testimony because like, there's so much great stuff going on. And here's what's super exciting. It has very little to do with Sunday. It has most, like the stuff that really excites me. I love it when we people turn up to church. Don't get me wrong. Every pastor's got that gig going on. But I love like what's happening because people on Monday are choosing Jesus and on Tuesday are pursuing the things of the kingdom. And on it goes. That's, that's the stuff that makes me very happy. And so anyway, let's move on. Verse 7. Um, do not be, so this is the, we're gonna, that was me doing a very quick commentary. This is where we're going to unpack. Do not be deceived. The big idea that we've got in this series is this. The enemy, the devil, uses deceptive ideas that play to disordered desires of our flesh that are normalized in a sinful society. And this is his strategy, the devil's strategy, to bring ruin to our souls and to society. Deceptive ideas that play to the disordered desires of our flesh that get normalized in a sinful society. That's how souls and societies just get wrecked. That's the devil's, that's his whole strategy. Uh, and so it says here, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man or woman reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. Really important to note here, where does the destruction come from? It's the flesh. Not from God. Nine times out of ten, the punishment for sin is the consequences of sin. And I've been saying this a lot. One of the, the most successful lies of the enemy is that he'll whisper to you, there's no long-term consequences to this decision. In fact, he'll say there's no consequences. And that's because often for sin, there isn't short-term consequences. You can actually get it. You can do it. And we wouldn't do it if it didn't feel good. Can I get a witness? <laughs> right? It's not like, oh, yeah, I'm going you know, to drink this horrible concoction. No, I'm going to drink the gin and tonic. Tastes amazing. Problem is I can have 10 of them because it tastes great. 
and you, then you get a buzz and you feel good in the short term. And you keep doing that and there's long-term consequences. And certain sin here, all of it's got long-term consequences. And so you're wise if you're like saying no to something because you can play it out in terms of where it's gonna, what it's going to do to affect you down the track. But here's the incredible, so the sin from the flesh, we reap destruction. Here's the great news. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. That is good news. Now, again, we've got to clear this up every time this comes along. Every time we say eternal life in the Western church because of a whole lot of dumb theology in recent years, people think of going to heaven when you die. But the, I mean, hopefully by now you're starting to get the message. Like every single time the Bible references them just about, every single time just about, there's some exceptions. But most of the time when the Bible talks about eternal life, it's talking about that future reality, that heavenly reality breaking into the present. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That living that more and more now. So that eternal life, that life where it's like, there's, there's no, again, nerd alert. I've got back into Lord of the Rings recently. And nerd alert. And so I'm like reading the books, I'm just about finished. And I've been watching the movies. You know, and like, you know, when they go into the elvish forests and all that, and it's like amazing. Like, I can't remember the name because I'm not that, I've got a bad name. Rivendell and Lothariel, both of them. Um, I, I was watching it this week and I was just like, that looks amazing. And I felt like God whispered to me, that's nothing compared to the age to come. And I was like, oh, I just felt like, imagine how peaceful, you know. And it's like, that's good theology. Like, we want to bring that vibe into the present in your soul, filled with love, joy, and peace, right? The, uh, the Greek re- literally is the life of the age to come. So let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't be, grow weary in doing good. Again, I've often read that it's like, okay, Harvey, keep, keep doing good things. Um, but this is in the context to the war we have with the flesh. So don't grow weary of doing good. Don't give up the fight of investing into the things of the spirit that see your soul flourish. Don't grow weary of that sort of stuff. Don't give up the fight. So that's the passage we're going to, let's dive in deeper particularly at this idea that, a, that I'm a man or a woman reaps what they sow. Now, this is bog-standard wisdom. This is not this is not just a Christian idea. Outside of the Bible, this is called the law of returns. So you can, end, you can finish the sentence for me if you want. What goes around, well, like Father, you get out what you, no pain, you get what you, yeah, garbage in, karma. Jesus said, given it will be given back to you, Pressed down, shaken together and running over. With the measure you used, it will be measured back to you and more. This is the law of returns. Um, So it's this basic idea that every action has a reaction. This is the the law of thermal dynamics. I don't know that. I just read some stuff this week that said that. So I believe it, okay? Pastor, not a nerd. No, well, yeah, (laughs) debatable. But here's the interesting thing. So every action, so that's like, okay, there's a whole lot of like, that makes sense. But the thing that's interesting is that the reaction is often disproportionate to the action. There's kind of an amplifying effect uh, where our actions yield far more than we expect over time. So Paul, who's living in this kind of agrarian culture, farmers, you know, that sort of stuff, he used the metaphor of sowing and reaping. Uh, I'm like plants come to our house to die. Um, so, you know, and our gardens just we just inherited a garden and now there's just a lot of other stuff, weeds are presumed, you know, it's just a nightmare. So oh, there's not my strength either. Um, in fact, none of the metaphors, I'm, I'm looking through, oh dear, there's nothing here that I'm really winning at, but that's all right. Um, but the idea, right, if you sow, some of you guys into this, if you sow a seed in springtime or whatever, lettuce, whatever, corn, right, you sow it, you'll get a corn back. Is that right? I mean, that's kind of the way it works. I tell you where I am good at, grass. I've so every year our, our outdoor pool kills the grass. We take it down for winter, and I just sow the grass because I'm like I don't want a dead patch on my lawn. And then I put the the, the the pool up every year on top of that same grass, and it dies again. But I love sowing the grass and then watching it come through. It's very exciting, right? Because you, know, you get on the angle, you can't see it, but you get on the angle. Oh, ee, there's grass coming through. But here's the thing: the second thing, though, reactions. But actually, with, with I don't know if, if you leave it long enough you're going to get more, like that can become a harvest. If you're intentional about how you sow, it can be a harvest in poor language. I reckon if maybe in today's society, like the idea of compound interest would be, you know, like Kiwi Saver would be a good example of this whole thing. 
Um, so I'm grateful, really grateful for KiwiSaver. <laughs> um, super helpful because especially if it plays out well, um, like this whole thing of compound interest is insane. Like if you put, get a little financial advice here from Harvey. The principle hasn't changed in this whole illustration. The principle, see, so put in, what is it, one grand here at the start. I'm going to start, so I feel like I need to be an Amway or so, you know, like I'm going to sign you up to something at the end of this. Um, and then you've got your interest, but, if the, but as, the, as the interest, uh, as, the, as the principle grows because of your interest, that then gets interest on itself in the combat, right? Does that make you guys know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> I'll sketch you. Now this is, so what Paul's saying is that this is the case with our flesh, and we all know what this feels like. It can, go, it can go the other way. You can tip that graph upside down and you can see it's like people start making choices in their 20s, don't deal with it, don't work through the brokenness that leads them there. And it's like you fast forward 20 years, there's a compound interest in terms of the effect it's had on their lives. You know that feeling where you make a dumb choice and then you just want to anesthetize your pain and you feel shame about it. You make another dumb choice. And before you know it, you're like self-sabotaging your life. And it's like, and you're like, how do I, and you just, it's so hard to get out of that downward spiral because the thing's got its energy of its own. But it can go the other way as well. We used to, and again, heaves, most of you guys will know this vibe. Make a good choice, turn up to church, turn up to upper click, get the huddle thing going, whatever. And you start to like choose something and then it's like, and, and the thing is it doesn't pay off straight away, but you still choose it. And, then you, and you, get, then you feel quite good about yourself and it makes it a little easier to make that next good choice for Jesus. And you keep going and you keep going. And before you know it, there's this whole momentum where you're going up and not down in terms of the state of your soul. And so this theologian Cornelius Plantiga uh, in a book uh, called um, Sin, uh, sorry, so there's a book on sin, it's called Not the Way It's Meant to Be. He said this about Paul's words in Galatians. No matter what we sow, the law of returns applies. Good or evil, love or hate, justice or tyranny, grapes or thorns, a, a gracious compliment or a peevish complaint. Whatever we invest, we tend to get it back with interest. Lovers are loved, haters hated. Forgivers usually get forgiven. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. God is not mocked for you reap what you sow. So Paul applies this whole idea of the law of returns not to retirement and Kiwi saver, but to our spiritual formation. Now, uh, spiritual formation is the process by which we're formed into a certain kind of person. And every time we sow to our flesh, uh, or every time we give in to flesh's desire to sin, we plant something in the soil of our hearts, which then begins to take root, grow, and eventually yield the harvest of a deformed nature, deformed soul. But thankfully, the same is true of the Spirit. Every time you sow into the Spirit and invest the resources of your mind and body into nurturing your inner man or woman's connection to the Spirit of God, you plant something deep within yourself, which over time takes root and bears the fruit of a Christ-like character. Again, Cornelius, he said this, A fuller statement of the great law of returns would therefore go something like this, Sow a thought, reap a deed. Sow a deed, reap another deed. Sow some deeds, reap a habit. Sow some habits, reap a character. Sow a character, reap two thoughts. The new thoughts then pursue careers of their own. Like it just starts, you're away. So the cycle of spiritual formation or deformation begins to feed off its own energy and either spiral out of control or culminate into Christ-likeness. So, for example, um, with every decision that we make, can someone turn off the um, the thing there? Thanks. With every decision we make to complain, criticize, play the victim, focus on the negative, so on, we become more and more the kind of person who is by nature negative, grouchy, unhappy, unpleasant to be around. Until eventually we we lose the very capacity to live happily, gratefully, and full of wonder at our lives in God's good world. Isn't that true? And this happens slowly, and this is the this is the, you know, the enemy subtly. You won't notice it in yourself that easily, right? But it's interesting that people around you will notice over time. 
You know, like when you bump into someone you haven't seen in 10 years? And it's like, and you can you get a little glimpse of the trajectory. I want that to be a good moment for my mates, right? You don't notice it in yourself. Uh, I, I, you know, again, I've been in ministry 20 years. And I think about kids in my youth group in my 20s. And some of them have made great choices. And some of them my heart is breaking. And it's like, because now it's like 20 years down the track since that youth group. And I'm starting to see the compound interest either way. This is, this is real. Nicky Gumbel beautifully said it this week in the little uh, post he put up. He said, if you don't fill that God-shaped gap with God, you'll fill it with an idol. You'll put something else instead of God. And even good things can become idols, politics or music or relationships, or we can fill it with harmful, harmful things like drugs. And he says this, and the thing with idols is this. At first they offer you everything and ask for nothing. But in the end, they cost you everything and give you nothing. Jesus is the opposite. His gifts are free and he gives us everything. He says, and Nicky Gumbel says, because although we have to pay the price as being known as a follower of Jesus and we may get opposition, the cost that we pay is nothing compared to the cost he paid when he died on a cross and took our sin and offered us forgiveness. With Jesus, it's like, doesn't cost us, cost him. And he still gives us everything. Every time we sow to the flesh, we feed the animalistic part of us and it grows and it takes more control over our freedom and attempts to eat us alive from the inside out. And this is why Peter, uh, in his uh, books in the New Testament, says, uh, he says he writes about those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh. And he says in time they become unreasoning, uh, and this is um, 2 Peter 2 verse 10 and verse 12, they become unreasoning animals, creatures of inst instinct, and like animals they too will perish. I mean, heavy words, but again, it's simply a reality. This is reality. And some of you guys are probably watching friends who are just choosing to satisfy the cravings of their flesh, and you're just seeing this destruction, and it's breaking your hearts. It's tough to witness when you've stepped outside of that space. He don't, Peter's not trying to be, to be mean, he's actually trying to be loving. The more people indulge the flesh, the more it takes over their whole beings and turns them into brutes, however socially sophisticated they may seem. People can be very socially sophisticated, incredibly self-centered. So Paul didn't mess around. He's like, you don't manage the flesh or try and keep it in check. You've got to crucify the flesh, right? In Galatians chapter 5. So you've got... But again, I'm trying to have a vision of like, what does it look like to, to feed the Spirit is incredible. Like the daily decision to rejoice, to cultivate a way of seeing our lives in God's good will, not through the lens of our phones or news apps or the flesh, but through gratitude and celebration and unhurried delight. Like you choose to do that over time, you'll be formed into a joyful, thankful people who deeply enjoy life with God and with others. What starts as an act of the will, I choose this, turns into your inner nature, just becomes who you are. What begins as a choice eventually becomes your character. I've mentioned this before, but um, one of the, the really helpful spiritual disciplines I've been practicing for a number of years now um, has been the practice of gratitude. And, um, and uh, this is again out of um, uh, 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 um, Philippians, is it? Or um, Philippians, where it's like, give thanks continually. Blair will help me, someone, give thanks continually, and all things rejoice. There we go. Thank you, Philippians. Oh, that'll do. We'll take that. Um, and so, and here's, here's the interesting thing. You know, like when you hit rock bottom, like when you really hit a wall, it's actually like, it's an invitation to break that downward cycle. And so for me, because I've got some stuff in my family line with depression, I've had to be very careful with that. And at times where I was like, oh man, I'm just tired of feeling flat and detached because when you're, depression isn't like I feel stink, it's feel nothing. Just like no, there's nothing. And so like, I'm like, I've, I've, and the struggle all of us have is actually applying it to our, all of the principles to our lives, right? So it's the gift of pain as it gets us to the point of application finally. Where it's like, stuff it, I've got to try something else. 
And so back in the day, I was like, that's it. I've got to practice gratitude because I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I want to change the way I'm looking at the world. I've got to, I've got to fight this battle. So got in the habit of, uh, of a, a three or four times a week in my, in my journal, writing five things I'm grateful for. And, and weirdly, when I started after the, you get through the initial list of kids, family, wife, whatever, it's like, then it's like I would start to struggle a bit. It's like, no, Harvey, this is insane. What are you grateful for? Oh, that tree's amazing. And a friend would come to mind. And, and it got easier and easier and easier and easier. And then it, it has, tra- I can promise, it's transformed. I've got a long way to go. But it's transformed the wiring of my brain where now I'm looking out. Just go, that's amazing. Oh, that's cool. Oh, aren't I lucky? I'm the best person in the world with this sort of group. Oh, man, you know, look at this church and that. Wish it was and I'm just cultivating this gratitude because I'm practicing it. And so this is where the gift of pain can help us break the cycle where we go, oh, now it's nuts. I've, I've got to start living a whole new way. We make decisions, and then our decisions make us. In the beginning, you have a choice, but eventually you've got a character. Right? Yeah, and what's the choice here? Grumpy or happy? Now, all of us want to be the happy dog. I've turned into a dog guy. I was previously a cat guy, but our cat, ironically, is called Happy, and he's grumpy the whole time, and our dog's called Blue, and he brings us nothing but joy. Uh, so, uh, and like all of us want this, but, it, but he, as we mentioned last week, you can't get the happy dog via willpower. Willpower's getting great when you have it. It's unreliable. We have access to the Spirit's power. Walk by the Spirit, again, this is all in Galatians chapter 5. Walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. This is the key to overcoming the flesh in this battle. It's to be filled with the Spirit. To, to walk around with the Spirit forming us, which, which then results in the compound interest of a flourishing soul tracking in the right direction. We, we need an ally in the fight to come alongside us and turn the tide. And John Mark in his book, Live No Life, says this, the pow- this, that power is the spirit of Jesus. How do we access? This is the key though. How do we access that power? Simple, via practices, spiritual practices. Willpower is at its best when it does what it can do, which is direct my body into spiritual practices so the spirit's power can do what willpower can't, overcome the three enemies of the soul, the devil, the flesh, and the world. And so we've been working under the hypothesis, this is key, that spiritual disciplines are spiritual warfare. Put it another way, the practices of Jesus are how we fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. Every sermon, we've given you practices at the end of the sermon to say, here's the things that you can do to apply to your life that'll help you win the battle of the world, the flesh, and the devil that we're all swirling around in. And again, Jesus at the beginning and the end of the Sermon on the Mount, so the people that build their life on the rock are the people that don't just hear my word, they hear my word and do it. They apply it to their lives. The greatest challenge in the Western church at the moment is not information, it's application. Because, I've said this riff a few times, information's helpful. But if information could change you, we'd be the most transformed church in all of Christian history. You can listen to the finest New Testament scholars, the most anointed preachers at the drop of a hat. If information could change something, we would be radically transformed. Where information is helpful is it brings revelation. You get wisdom. Ah, but resonance is not obedience. It's the application that brings transformation. And so we've had many people that have believed in Jesus in the Western church. Now it's time to follow him. Where every single Day, our life is orientated around Him. We were, every year we're learning more practices, spiritual practices that inform our journey with Him so that we can look back and, be, and, and honestly say we have been transformed from glory to glory to glory because I've applied the Word to my life. So the devil uses... Uh, uh, so again, one of the, um, the, the tools in, and the first thing was the, with the devil was like, is to use scriptures that speak truth to that lie. Apply that to your, have scriptures memorized when the devil whispers lies to you and, uh, and put in place a filth filter, a filth filter. Intentionally fill yourself with truth and goodness and lower as much as you can the filth that we swim in in our wider society. But these are all, all of these things are counter habits uh, to, to, to those of our flesh. And these habits are based on the life and teachings of Jesus that resist the habits of the flesh. 
as I said earlier, that when we do things that are broken and sinful and indulge that part of us, um, can I just say, it's just a symptom of a soul that's not been tended to and a soul that's not living the way of Jesus. They're symptoms. Drinking too much, porn, drugs, overeating, negativity, victim mentality, whatever it may be. All of that stuff's just the symptoms. I think it's helpful. Like It actually takes a little bit of the shame away. It's like when you think about your brokenness, like you know, it's just a symptom of a soul that hasn't found its home yet. So how can I go upstream to the source and deal with the stuff up here rather than just try and fight the symptoms all the time? That's why you get filled with the Spirit. So you could be gracious with yourself. We're all vulnerable and we're all in this battle. And see your dysfunction as an invitation to discover these spiritual practices that will deeply satisfy. Holy moly. Uh, Every time you practice a habit of Jesus, your spirit... So another way of to think of your spirit is like your inner, like that inner willpower muscle gets a little stronger and your flesh, that little inner animal, gets a little weaker. But the amazing thing is that these practices aren't just the counter habits to work out our willpower muscles. So like those practices help, but they also, those practices are the means to which we access the spirit's power. So the practices, and I'm going to talk about a a couple of them as we come to land in a second, the practices not only help us overcome the flesh, but they are the means to which we access the Spirit's power. Okay, Uh, I'm going to say this. They enable us to live from an animating energy and and a force from heaven that is far more powerful than than any inner resource that we could draw on, which is why they're called spiritual practices. They're spiritual in that they open us to the Spirit, as Gordon Fee said, God's empowering presence among us. And so there's a bunch of uh, of things I want to um, speak to that that are practices that can help us, particularly in this fight of the flesh. Um, I was talking to Abby about this at the end of the service last week, actually. The interesting thing with the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit will speak very practi- really practically to you about things that you can do that will enable your life to make it easier to make good decisions and a little bit more difficult to make bad decisions. So, like, often I think we think the Holy Spirit is some ethereal vibe, which, I mean, I'm all about. And, yes, when I sit in the presence of God and I get filled with His life, temptation diminishes. But also the Holy Spirit has spoken to me countless times about very practical things I can do that make it a little bit more difficult to make a dumb decision and a little bit easier to make a good decision. For example, one of the things that I struggle with uh, is mooching around on my phone in the evening. Can I get a witness? All right, so it's like, and it's like with billions of dollars. I've just read a book called Stolen Focus. Billions of dollars. Very smart people, uh, you know, smartest people in the world trying to design apps that keep you on your phone. Very addictive, highly addictive, and a great soul destroyer. Am I right or am I right? No one spends an evening mooching on their phone and then comes out going, I feel like a million bucks. Oh, yes, I feel so good in my soul. No, you just waded through filth, and most of the time you're envious of everyone else's life and you feel really dissatisfied with yours and all the rest of it, right? And it's so addictive because it never ends. Well, what, what if I miss out on something interesting? I'll keep scrolling. Oh, it's midnight. Oh, one more scroll. And these, all of us have thumbs that have muscles, the like Arnie's, you know? Um, and so I struggle with that whole thing. And so um, I don't know. It's again, iPhones are dumb. There again, we're just going to, that's a thing Bay Vineyard's all about. We're anti iPhone. No jokes. Um, but Android, Android's are great phones uh, because I can download on here, <laughs> I can download on my Android this app called Digital Detox that locks my phone after 5 30. And iPhones, and I have to pay money to de lock it. And I'm a nerd, so I know how to like get past things. I have to pay money to de... And so, and now everyone's like, well, how does that work if you want to check your bank balance? Or how does that work? Oh, well, Digital Detox allows me to select certain very boring apps that I might need in the queue at the supermarket or whatever to pay the bills. So I've got a few select apps that, and, uh, and I've got a Kindle on there because I think reading on my phone's fine, okay? At 5.30, locked. And then it's like, and I still struggle. Oh, I hate you, Digital Detox. I really do. But it's, again, the Holy Spirit's like prompted me. It's like, that's enough. I'm sick of living like this. I'm, I'm downloading it. I don't care. I'm going to do it. And in that moment, my willpower is my friend. And the Holy Spirit's combined my willpower to help me make a little decision that makes it harder to make a dumb choice and easier to make a good choice to end up spending an energy, a night that's going to fill my tank a little bit, which means I'm most likely going to win the next morning with Jesus. 
And on and on we go. So Holy Spirit's very pragmatic on some of the stuff. But the spiritual disciplines are key when it comes to the flesh. And John Mark in his book suggests two practices that I'm not going to unpack, and I'll explain why. Um, the two practices he hits in his book, which I'd love you to read if you know, I know many of you are reading it, are fasting and confession in terms of spiritual practices that help us overcome the things of the flesh. Um, now, the reason is we're going to do a 21-day season of prayer and fasting in term four as a church. And after Live No Lies, I've got, um, I've got a full head of steam when it comes to what I believe God's got for us as a church. And I'm going to do a couple of messages on fasting, and we're going to talk about why passion needs to be greater than complacency at this time of history. And we're going to, you know, go team talking, we're going to do fasting. Now, I hate fasting. I've got a black belt in feasting. Um, and, and I blame Megan for the little prompt that got us down this road. But it's like, oh, no, it's him. It really is. And we committed ourselves to be radically obedient to his voice in this church. So we're going to go for 21 days of prayer and fasting. That doesn't mean everyone's going to do 21 days. Whatever, we're going to unpack that later, okay? We're going to do whole sermons on that. Uh, but that's a good one to crucify the flesh. Am I right or am I right? Um, and it's been a hugely neglected spiritual discipline in the Western church, again, because we love our flesh. We want to have pleasure and we want to satisfy our flesh and we want a little bit of Jesus. And it's like, no, nah, you've got to choose all Jesus or nothing, man. All right, here we go. The other one's confession. Uh, and uh, we're not going to, um, I may do some stuff on that, but again, read the book if you've got it, because actually our huddles and accountability groups and ideally in our home churches, we're trying to normalize gentle confession. Where you really at? Just be honest about it. And so we're trying to have a culture of real honesty in this community. Um, and this might take community rest of it. But here's three spiritual disciplines that have been incredibly helpful in overcoming the flesh. Um, an order of priority, really. The first thing is uh, I want to say to, to overcome the flesh, the Holy Spirit will invite us into places of deep healing to heal the bruises and wounds of the past that cause us to want to numb our pain. And so to uh, one of the best spiritual practices is to pursue wholeness, to walk into wholeness, to hug the cactus, as I like to call it, is to hug, is to invite Jesus into that deeply broken part of yourself and invite him to come and speak his truth. And we all have to work through our family of origin, most of us will have some trauma from the past or some grief. We have to wrestle with this desire of power control that we have. All of us have to surrender to our limits. I've said this before, whatever pain you don't transform, you will transmit. Whatever pain you don't transform, you transmit. And interestingly, sometimes that transmission of the pain looks like a pendulum swing the other way. Um, oh, I won't go into it. Time. Um, but when we, uh, and I, I've been in counselling a lot, uh, in my first 10 or 15 years of, of, of uh, full-time ministry, I was in counselling, I reckon, once a year. And it's like, because I was like, I want, I want wholeness in Jesus. And I'd hit these broken parts of my life, and it's like the arrogance to think I can somehow do this on my own. I mean, it is, it's just arrogance. So I'd eat the humble pie, and I'd pick up my cross, and it looked like picking up the phone and ringing up a counsellor. Or it looked like talking to a mate of mine and having a really honest, raw chat about where I was really at. Or it looked like responding to an altar call at my church or, or, or ringing up some... Free, like, this is key. There's no shortcuts around this. And like, you choose to do this, you're investing into your spirit. It's not easy going through it, but I tell you what, the compound interest in terms of how your soul feels at the end of it is worth the price of admission. I mean, the story doesn't end on Sunday where you have to pick up your cross. The story ends on, uh, sorry, on Friday when you pick up your cross. It ends on Sunday with new life bursting into the world. It's the case for all of this stuff. So it's not easy. So I know many of you guys are doing this. You're in counseling or you're, doing, you're going through the, yes, keep doing it. So good because this will help you overcome the battle of your flesh. You don't, you don't want to like feed that broken part of you when you've dealt deeply with the brokenness in it. It sets you free. And so we're very committed to this. Next slide, we've got on our home. So the book I'd recommend if, you, if you're like, this is the Spirit's prompting me, I've got to go here, is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Very, and just my advice, and I've, and I've done this, and I've encouraged many people to do it, read it with a journal open. 
and just journal your way through what the Lord says to you and it will bring deep healing. And ideally do that in community and process it together. Go to a council, blah, blah, blah. We've also got a home church resource called Walking Into Wholeness that takes the ideas from this book and unpacks them in a Kiwi way. And so uh, you don't have to be in a home church to access that stuff. Even if you're in a huddle, one of the ideas is you could say, we're going to listen to one of those talks midweek and then we're going to, in a huddle, just feed back what we're learning in terms of the journey that God's got us on. Cool? So that's the first discipline is, is, uh, to, is to walk into wholeness. The second discipline is Sabbath rest. Um, I was cracking up just, I was preparing my sermon on, and uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I've been banging this drum for so long now. <laughs> that was 14 years ago, I was blogging about Sabbath. And, and so this, this, this is like the most ancient spiritual discipline in the Bible. And again, one of these really neglected ones in the Western church for some reason. It was literally punishable. Like it goes back to Genesis 1, for goodness sake. It's like the story of the Exodus is walking into Sabbath rest. It was punishable by death if you didn't do it. It's in the Ten Commandments. I've said this before. Like any good Christian that breaks the other nine commandments, we're like, oh, that's naughty. You shouldn't do that. Bowing down to idol, committing adultery, lying, whatever it may be. But it's like if we all work seven days a week, oh, good on you. You're really committed. You must be super important. Oh, you know, you're bleeding to keep the flag rigged. And it's like, it's crazy how we've baptized busyness in the church. It's insane. And the flesh is weak when we're tired. The flesh is weak. What does it look like to lead and live from a place of rest? That's the invitation of Sabbath. Um, You know, I've got to say, though, it it took me, again, the the whole thing of bricks here, um, the whole, you know, it's like the Israelites' identity was caught up in how much they could produce for Pharaoh. And when they came into the desert place, they had to have a whole new identity that was around, no, you're just loved. And Sabbath rest is the evidence that you're accepting that identity, that you're loved. So my thing is, like, if you can't stop, it says that your identity isn't in Jesus, it's in what you produce. You can prove to me that your identity is in God because you can stop and slow down. And now it took me years to get this dialed in, years and years and years. We're a microwave culture here and we think that we just read the book and it's it's like, no, years of fighting for it because we are so deformed by our culture that it's going to take us a few years to to get reformed into the image of Jesus, the way he wants us to live. So you've got to fight for this. I've been fighting for this for years, but I'm so passionate about it. It, Again, I've heard every excuse as to why people can't do it. Don't you think God's smart enough to help you navigate that? If he came up with the idea, he can help navigate the limitations of whatever it may be. Actually, most of it's brokenness. You know, I had to hit the counselling room. Why is it so hard for me to slow down? It's brokenness. But it's this brokenness that's that's like commended in our society. But I'm trying to create a culture here where it's like, well, that's not too healthy, mate. You know, we start showing it for what it really is. And so uh, it's an incredible gift. It's our gift for leaving Egypt where our worth came out of the amount of bricks we produced. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton, in her book, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, amazing, she says, there's something about establishing rhythms that are gracious and accepting of our human limits that enables us to be gracious and and accepting of others. Listen to this. There is an energy that comes from being rested that is different from the energy that comes from being driven. I'm just so, so desperate as a pastor to lead from a place of rest, contemplation, prayer, depth, margin, spend still with Jesus. And I'm fighting for that tooth and nail. But I can tell you now, after at least 15 years of fighting for Sabbath and fighting for the spiritual discipline, the compound interest reality couldn't be overstated enough. Like, honestly, on Friday morning, so Sunday's the best day for the average Joe to have a Sabbath. I've got a wee gig on Sunday that makes it tricky. But a great day, fellowship, worship, slow down, nap, rest, do all the jobs on Saturday so that you can, as Hebrews says, make every effort to enter into the rest of God. So we do some work, extra things on Saturday so we can rest on Sunday and nap and great food and, you know, pleasure stack as much as you can. And it's this day where you just celebrate who God and blah, blah, blah. We'll we'll talk about this and the other things there. But but Friday's my Sabbath day. And I was sitting there on Friday, like like by 10 o'clock, my soul's gushing, like overflowing with joy. 
And I'm just sitting there just like still in the presence of God doing my devos. And I'm just sitting outside listening to music. And I'm like getting emotional with how great, how beautiful this moment is. And then as a pastor, because I know I'm going to do this little riff in a couple of days, I start aching with longing that my church would know this feeling of Sabbath rest. And it's like Sabbath rest, it's like... And so I like, I'm already like, oh my gosh, Sabbath was amazing. It was just so good. And then I'm not going to go through my week and then I'm going to be like, ah, Sabbath is coming, Sabbath is coming. Ah, cornucopia of delight and pleasures. Ah, ah, and it's like, I just, and it compound interest years of that. So anyway, the, the, the uh, resources of that, uh, another John Mark Coma book uh, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Many of our guys have read it, been challenged by it. Uh, but reread it and just let's continue the conversation going. We've also got a whole home church module on Sabbath rest. Last, now who guess, anyone let's guess what the last practice will be. Church, someone? Huh? Come on, somebody. What's my favourite hobby horse? What do I drum to? Huh? Devotional life. Well done. Well done. Every, hey, devotional practice. Now we've got a few resources on that one. So those are in order of importance. For me, emotional health, pursuing wholeness, Sabbath rest, devotional. Mate, this is where we get into the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is where we feed the things of the Spirit. Um, and I've banged this drum enough. I'm not going to bang. I'm not going to go on too long here because you've heard me say it almost every week. But we've got a whole stack of home church models on that. A whole bunch of books that will stir that up within you. Um, so let's come into land. Uh, but I will say this, again, compound interest. This, the biggest thing the enemy's gone after is this in the church. No doubt about it, because we've got a culture of honesty in our church and because I travel around a bit. This is, we're in, like I'm, I'm in every pastor's meeting I go to, I'm, hitting, I'm not hitting the alarm button. This is crisis moment for the Western church. This has been under attack. We've had a weapon of mass distraction in our lives now for a number for over a decade, and it is destroying the inner life of most Christians. And we have not had a discipleship culture that's helped our uh, millennials and under come up with an understanding about what it means to have a quiet time. We are paying a massive price for that, uh, blah, 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 right? So you've heard me, uh, but it's like you choose to keep fighting for that because it's a fight and the compound interest. Come on, some of the boys here, come on. Mikey, come on, come on, come on, all the upper bit boys and all that. It's like, mate, the compound interest around you, just keep choosing it. And then what that does to your soul over the long term, it's literally heaven on earth. It's literally heaven on earth. And then it's like, do I feel like, do I feel like doing something naughty when I'm filled with love, joy, and peace? And my soul's filled with wonder and gratitude? All the other stuff gets exposed for the counterfeit it is. It's counterfeit joy, counterfeit peace, counterfeit love. But when you choose, when you get, go to the source of the real stuff, so deeply satisfying. So deeply satisfying. These are the practices. There's no shortcuts. These are the practices that will help us overcome the flesh. I love that line that I read out earlier. Willpower is at its best when it does what it can, which is direct my body into spiritual practices so that the spirit's power can do what the willpower can't overcome the three enemies of the soul. That's brilliant. That's key. And so Paul exhorts the church to not become weary of doing what is right. because Why? Because you can. You can just get weary of this fight that we're all in. Amen? So you just get weary of the fight that we're in. But Paul's like, no, don't give up. Don't, even the, don't grow weary. No, hang in there. Keep choosing the way of Jesus. Keep praying. Keep reading the Bible. Keep going to vulnerable places. Keep going to your home church. Keep going to upper clicks. Keep going to huddles. Keep practicing. Keep going to church. Do it. Keep praying for your kids that have wandered from God. Keep fighting for your devos, prioritizing your marriage. Keep turning up and there will be a harvest. It's like a harvest of righteousness, a new sense of life and freedom and joy and a new depth. Invest so into that place. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For in the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen?